Hello, I'm David Jugget, Member of Parliament for Banff and Buchan and Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for 22Q11 Deletion Syndrome. Not long after being elected, I was introduced to this condition by a constituent who came to see me with her 10-year-old son who has 22Q. This was the first time I'd heard of the condition, but it didn't take long for me to appreciate the frustration that patients and their families have about the lack of awareness of the condition among not just the general public, but also among educators and even medical practitioners. 22Q is a common disability hiding in plain sight. As a GP or medical student, would you recognise it? It has a prevalence of 1 in 500 of the population, but it is massively underdiagnosed. This is twice that of Down syndrome and almost six times that of cystic fibrosis, for example. 128,000 people in the UK are estimated to be affected, but only 2,187 have been confirmed through the regional genetic kiss centres as of the end of 2016. This means that as a doctor, in your career, you are more likely to see a 22Q patient than a cystic fibrosis patient or a Down syndrome patient. But would you recognise the syndrome? The frequency of 22Q, coupled with its seriousness and varied clinical consequences, makes a good case for including the condition in future antenatal screening programmes. More specialist clinics are required, as well as multidisciplinary treatment programmes. I hope that this short film will provide you with some helpful information, which will help to highlight those patients who need further investigation and to gain the correct diagnosis, to help support them and to gain the appropriate treatment for 22Q11 syndrome. What do we mean when we talk about chromosome 22Q11.2? Well, that is a small region of the 22nd chromosome, and normally we have two copies. The most severe syndrome is when patients are lacking one copy of 22Q11.2, and there is the opposite situation where patients have an extra copy, three copies, of 22Q11.2. A questionnaire sent to the UK genetics clinics revealed that there were approximately two and a half thousand patients on the books. But a very large multi-centre study has recently suggested that the incidence of the deletion syndrome could be as high as one in a thousand live births, with the duplications occurring at an equivalent frequency. This could imply that there are as many as 60,000 deletion syndrome patients at large in the country. Well, one of the main causes of morbidity and mortality in the condition is congenital heart disease. And by its very nature, these children are born with this series of heart defects. And the surgeons have to often intervene very early in the infant's life. These children are very susceptible to infection. They're also susceptible to hypocalcemic fitting. So clearly, close monitoring of the serum calcium has to be undertaken. Because of the huge range of presentation of the condition, and these patients undergo what's called a diagnostic odyssey, where they present at different clinics with their various problems for a number of years. The diagnosis of 22Q11 can lead to a raft of interventions, all aimed at providing these individuals with a much better quality of life. We are now at a point where we would be able to consider neonatal screening uh, for this condition, or indeed non-invasive prenatal diagnosis through the identification of fetal DNA in the maternal circulation. So hopefully in the near future we will be able to diagnose 22Q11 deletion and duplication prior to birth. One of the important aspects of my work has been helping to establish a 22Q11 multidisciplinary clinic and in that clinic we've had a variety of specialists, specialists and the important thing about specialists in a condition such as 22Q is that they are essential to modern day practice.
In these situations, we can see that manifestations such as a congenital heart disease presenting in infancy, linked perhaps with particular uh, tendency to easy infections, feeding difficulties, or and biochemical disorders, which may result such as hypocalcemia from stress, add up to a condition like 22Q. That's all very easy, but actually if we only have one or two of these manifestations, then the clinician is in a situation of either doubt or uncertainty, or I have to say some ignorance of the possibility of alternative additional diagnoses. Additional pointers might be the facial features, not so easy to detect in the newborn, but as the child grows and develops, you can see these are subtle features. We don't expect everybody to be an expert in identifying conditions such as 22Q, despite its increasing relevance and understanding of just how frequent it really is in our populations. Presentation of the condition can be at all stages in the life cycle. In fact, interuterine diagnosis is now quite well established insofar as identification of congenital heart lesions. This is important particularly if there is a mother with a congenital heart disease. One in ten of all who are diagnosed at the present with this condition have a parent who is similarly carrying the deletion. They may or may not be affected. That no two people, even within the same family, may have the same profile. Kids with 22Q can get, they're also at a really significantly increased risk of getting things like mental health problems. Those things come at significant cost to the individual, their families and societies. So things like ADHD, anxiety, psychosis are all very treatable. It's just a question of identifying that person with 22Q, giving them a good assessment and working out what the problem is and providing them with, with appropriate treatment. As people get older with 22Q, we know that as they progress through from childhood through teenage years, um, some of the mental health problems that people develop um, can change somewhat. So in primary school years, we tend to see things like autism spectrum, ADHD. As people move on into teenage years, it's the same thing other teenagers get, things like getting a bit anxious, obsessive compulsive disorder, low mood. And then uh, moving on to later teenage years, one of the primary health concerns of people with 22Q is the onset, early onset of psychosis. And people with 22Q are at a very significantly increased risk of having an episode of psychosis. It's one of the most common causes of psychosis, but again it's often not picked up and not managed or identified for people with 22Q. This partly goes back to some of the problems about mental health and neurodevelopmental disorders, almost being, if you like, a, a Cinderella field within the field of medicine or healthcare. There's particularly poor provision for mental health care, and then within that, for people with neurodevelopmental disorders or genetic anomalies, they're often overlooked, despite having very significant health problems that are very easily treated if only people can have access to treatment. So I think that's perhaps one of the most important messages that we'd hope is really clear for you all today is 22Q is actually much more common than people used to think. People present with problems that are very treatable and if they're not treatable they cause significant problems for those young people across the lifespan for people with 22Q and thinking that possibly are they at increased risk of getting age-related developmental disorders but at an earlier age. So psychosis at an earlier age in teenage years, Parkinson's at an earlier age in middle adulthood. Some people with 22Q seem to have quite specific learning difficulties, so they may find bits of math quite hard work, and that may be specifically around some mathematical calculations or some money calculations, um, whereas reading may be a relative strength and an enjoyable thing for people with 22Q. Very early 
evidence suggesting monitoring of anxiety and monitoring of people's cognitive profile with 22Q is re actually really important for a variety of reasons. One of those is monitoring whether people are at particular risk of developing psychosis. Parents tell us that they often go to clinics, particularly in the community and in education, and even in the hospitals, their local hospitals, and the doctors and the nurses and other professionals that see them have not had it, know nothing about the condition. Indeed, they've never heard of it. The parent is the expert, and they're telling the professional about the condition. Parents need a, a clinic which they can turn to which are filled with specialists who have seen lots of children with, and young people with this problem. These clinics have actually grown up out of the passion um, that individual clinicians have had um, in, in dealing with 22Q. And so these clinics are not funded at all. see many patients and families that are really in a very stressed uh, situation because they're not getting the help they need. Cognition starts to drop off, their learning ability starts to drop off and when that happens this is a real red flag that maybe they are going to be in that group of patients around 25-30% who go on to develop uh, psychosis. How they speak is very distinctive. So often they use a lot of sounds like a glottal stop, which is like an uh sound. So the sentence such as Tim is putting a hat on would be Im put an a hat on. So it's very distinctive. And if you hear that, that isn't normal, normally found in children who are late in talking. And they sound so they're talking down their nose like this. So um, Often these children need to be seen by a cleft lip and palate team um, and investigations undertaken to look at how the palate shuts off the mouth from the nose when we are talking. 